I just found this really interesting article about Abraham Lincoln. It was written by Doris Kearns Goodwin. She's a presidential scholar. She wrote that book, Team of Rivals, about President Lincoln and his cabinet. And she said, President Lincoln learned how to keep his cool on social media even before there was such a thing as social media. <laughs> Apparently, he would get really upset with his critics and sometimes his colleagues and, and even people that said that they supported him but didn't really support him. And he would write these letters expressing his anger and his vitriol and his hostility toward people. But he never sent them out. They were discovered years later, a whole treasure trove filled with letters that Lincoln never sent out. And in many instances, he never even signed them. He expressed his hostility without dumping his hostility on other people. And boy, oh boy, if more of us could learn how to do that on social media, if more of us can learn how to control ourselves, I mean, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit, isn't it? Galatians 5, 22 to 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 2 Timothy 1, 7. God didn't give us a spirit of timidity, but of, timidity, but of power and of love and of self-control. And Paul preached about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come to Governor Felix in Acts chapter 24. And I bring this up because in 1 Samuel 24, King David exercises self-control and doesn't fight fire with fire. Because when you fight fire with fire, everybody gets burned. He has a chance to hurt King Saul, but we're going to see his godliness. We're going to see his character. Let's pick up the action. 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. Now that's near where the Dead Sea is in the southeastern part of the country. There are a lot of caves overlooking the sea. There are also a lot of tropical trees. It's really quite a nice area. Verse 2, so Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. You know, it's so horrible that King Saul doesn't lift a finger to fight the Philistines in chapter 23, yet he sends out the entire army looking for one man. And that one man is not his enemy, that one man is his friend. Oh, how Saul has misplaced his priorities. He is following his anger and his fear and his paranoia rather than following God in faith. Verse 3, Saul came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in there to relieve himself. You know, the Bible tells you everything, doesn't it? <laughs> Saul has to go to the bathroom. He puts his pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else. Okay, he doesn't wear pants, he wears robes, but you get the idea. He's using the bathroom. Just so happens that David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, David, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Apparently, God told David that there would be a day like this, and they're saying, that day is today. You can take him out now. You can kill the king. And you can take your rightful place as the anointed Melech Yisrael, the anointed king of Israel. Then David crept up unnoticed. He's got the knife. He could kill Saul with one swing of the knife. But what does he do instead? He cuts off a corner of his robe. He shows mercy. Now, figuratively speaking, this is showing how Almighty God is cutting away Saul's authority. He's cutting away his reign, cutting short his reign. So, figuratively speaking, this is saying volumes. 
But verse 5, David was conscious stricken for even doing that much, for having cut off a corner of his robe. He showed mercy, but he even feels bad about what he did. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. God put him in that position. And if I'm going to become Melech Yisrael, if I'm going to become king of Israel, then I'm going to let God do the work. If King Saul is standing in my way, I'm going to let God get him out of the way. I'm not going to burden myself with bloodshed so that people will be able to say, I'm a, I'm a killer, I'm a murderer, I'm a man of blood, I'm an opportunist. And, and he's teaching his men godliness and character and self-control. Verse 7, with these words, David sharply rebuked his men because maybe some of the men were saying, okay, David, you don't have to kill King Saul. I'll do it for you. And then you can say, well, I ain't got no control over my men and you'll become king over Israel. But David even restrained not only himself, he restrained them and said, don't do it. Let God handle it. And Saul left the cave and went his way. And now David's thinking, all right, I did the right thing, but I'm going to let Saul know that I did the right thing so he won't be wasting his life chasing after me. Now, I found some interesting quotes about this. This is from David Guzik's exposition of 1 Samuel. And by the way, I recommend Guzik to anybody. I think he's a, a fabulous commentator coming from the Calvary Chapel tradition. He says, sometimes when we have a promise from God, we think we're justified in sinning in order to get the promise of God. But this is always wrong. God will fulfill his promises, but he'll do it his way and righteously. Instead, we need to be like Abraham who obeyed God even when it seemed to be at the expense of God's promise, willing to sacrifice the son of promise. We need to be like Jesus, who didn't take Satan's offer to win back the world at the expense of obedience, Luke 4. In all this, we see that David knew not only how to wait on the Lord, he knew how to wait for the Lord. F.B. Meyer says, we wait on the Lord by prayer, we wait for the Lord by patience and submission. David was determined that when he sat on the throne of Israel, it wouldn't be because he got Saul out of the way, but because God got him out of the way. And David comes out of the cave in verse 8 and says to Saul, My lord, the king! When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself to the face, with his face to the ground. Now think about the faith and trust that David had to have in God and the courage from God to get out there in front of Saul and all his men. Because David not only could have killed Saul, but he didn't. He put himself in a situation where Saul and his men could have killed him. But he trusted God. Apparently he was thinking something along the lines like, I trusted God in the cave. I can trust him outside the cave. I trusted God by showing mercy. I'm going to trust God that he's going to show mercy. And verse 9, he said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say David is trying to harm you? This day you've seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. And some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father. Remember, Saul calls him derisively the son of Jesse. But David shows respect to Saul and calls him my father and my Lord. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. And Saul's probably like, well, holy cow, he did. <laughs> 
See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you're hunting me down to take my life. May Yahweh Elohim, may the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you've done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes from evil doers come evil deeds, so I'm not going to touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. So David is out there praying that God will deliver him from the very person that he's talking to all alone out in public. Verse 16. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, is that your voice, David, my son? And now he's using the son language for David instead of son of Jesse or that person. Yeah, sometimes I wonder if Saul's a little bipolar. I mean, his mood swings are, are just enormous. Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud, you're more righteous than I. That's a very true statement. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. That's another true statement. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you didn't kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king. Wow, he's sounding like his son Jonathan now. And that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. Well, David already made that promise to Jonathan. He, he swore friendship in the name of the Lord to not do harm to Jonathan or his descendants. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home. But David and his men went up to the stronghold. You know, instead of David coming back out and acting like nothing was wrong, I think David is still on his guard. You know, we'll see over the course of time whether or not King Saul is a person of his word. You know, right here, Saul seems really mournful and sorrowful and full of repentance. But repentance is something you prove by your actions over the course of time. Here's a statement that I came across as I was looking at this chapter. The validity of repentance and a changed heart isn't demonstrated by the emotion and sincerity of the moment. It is demonstrated by the ongoing direction of one's life. And David had every right to say, I'm going to stay in the stronghold until I see the direction of Saul's life. You know, one of the things I like about this is that David shows restraint, and he refuses to allow bitterness and anger to enter his heart. Now, just because David did it on this occasion doesn't mean that David shouldn't be careful in the future. In the very next chapter, there's going to be a Saul-like figure named Nabal who will speak derisively of David and poorly treat David. And he's not the king of Israel. And David is going to have a hard time controlling his rage and his bitterness and his anger against him. And it's going to take a very godly woman of faith to intervene to keep David from sabotaging his own life and his own future. That's coming up on Monday. In the meantime, what I would like you to do is I would like you to pray to the Lord about any anger or grudges or bitterness you may be having in your life as we enter into this weekend. Ask God to take it away. Maybe you can even visualize the person in front of you saying, there are so many times I was so angry with you, I wanted to speak badly of you. I wanted to even verbally or even more so do harm against you but I'm letting that go at the foot of the cross. I choose to show you grace and mercy and forgiveness in the name of Jesus. And sometimes when you're angry with somebody, you got to do that on a regular basis until the anger is gone. But I want to encourage you to do that. 
Jesus was like that. First, first Peter chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When they mocked, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but you have returned to the bishop and overseer of your soul. So Jesus, instead of holding on to bitterness, he went to the cross, died for our sins, said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, rose from the dead. And now none of that anger lives in him rent free, just like anger doesn't live in David in this story rent free. Don't let it get a hold of you either. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. You guys have a wonderful weekend. This Sunday, we're going to be looking at a couple of short parables of Jesus from Matthew 13, verses 44 to 46, the parable of the treasure in the field and the pearl of great price. And the message is called the kingdom of heaven, priceless. You have a great weekend. Bye-bye.